I would say that well over 99% of the language demand that we see within the hospitals uh, come from our top 100 to 150 languages. Welcome to the Business of Healthcare podcast from the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management. The center is based at the Naveen Jindal School of Management at the University of Texas at Dallas. The show, like the center, brings together business leaders and other forward thinkers to discuss how best to meet the challenges of a rapidly changing, increasingly complex healthcare industry. I'm your host, Dr. Bob Kaiser, Director of the Master's Program in Healthcare Leadership and Management for Professionals. Today, we're connecting with two healthcare professionals who specialize in translation and interpretive services. From Austin, Texas, we have Esther Diaz. She's a translator and interpreter trainer. She's also the co-founder of TAHIT, T-A-H-I-T, and that stands for the Texas Association of Healthcare Interpreters and Translators. She's also an advocate for language access. In addition, from Houston, Texas, actually Galveston, we have Manuel Higginbotham. He's the manager of language access services for the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston, and he's also the current president of TAHIT. And we are in the UT Dallas office, so we're connecting the dots across Texas. So welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Okay. So, you know, the Business of Healthcare podcast, you know, we explore many dimensions of healthcare. And in the past, we've had some discussions really centered around some of the social determinants of healthcare, of which one very important item is access to healthcare. And I know language can be a huge barrier just in general limiting access to healthcare service in particular. So let's start with the problem of not having language support and how it's being dealt with today in the United States. So um, as our diversity increases across the country, we certainly uh, more commonly experience patients who are unable to communicate with their healthcare providers. Uh, those of us who work in language access in healthcare, um, that is our daily battle, is convincing providers within a hospital that they need to engage with an interpreter, um, that they need to provide written materials to their patients in the languages that they speak, and helping them to understand why it's important and how it makes their jobs easier and uh, how they can do a better job of having good outcomes for their patients. So it sounds to me like the quality factor is a really important thing, Manuel and Esther. Um, You you want to increase, you know, the quality, improve the quality of communication, and not everybody's aware of the right process, the right procedures? And that's correct. And um, from my experience talking to many doctors, they say that a patient's medical history is the most important diagnostic tool. It's more important than an x-ray, an MRI, or any kind of a blood test. And if they can't fully communicate with a patient, then they're deprived of that very important tool to assess the patient's condition and determine a treatment plan. So not only using interpreters who who claim to speak a language, but people who are actually assessed for that language, who are trained in the protocols of interpreting and are truly qualified to interpret, are the people who should be used to interpret. Because using an unqualified interpreter is the equivalent of using a broken MRI machine or a non-calibrated spirometer. You're going to get wrong results. And if you base your treatment plan on those incorrect results, then you're going to end up with medical errors. So using trained, qualified, and assessed interpreters will reduce those medical errors, will reduce readmissions, and also can reduce costs. Because if you don't have a complete medical history, if you can't understand your patient, you're in a guessing game. So a provider will order many medical tests just to try to figure out what's wrong. And they could have saved the cost of those tests by getting a complete and accurate history from the patient. Yeah, that just makes good common sense. Everybody in, who's a provider would think <clears throat> those, those factors, they all want that to happen. They want to reduce cost and readmissions and things like that. So when we, we talk about interpretation and translation, 
The world is a pretty big place. I think there's four or 5,000 languages, probably 2,000 that are still spoken. What languages are in scope? Is it the top five, the top 20 languages? How do you deal with that broad of an issue? So working within a hospital setting, we have lots of tools that are at our disposal, and any good hospital is going to have a well-rounded and holistic approach to language access. They're going to have employees who are trained and assessed, uh, who are able to step in and speak the language, and because our patients come from many different places in the world, so do our providers and our employees. So that is one uh, step. Uh, the other is that the most common type of uh, our modality of interpreting is telephonic interpreting. And so every hospital should be contracting with agencies who are able to provide uh, a language at a moment's notice when a patient presents. And so the telephone is a great way to do that, a great way to get a conversation started until you can call an on-site interpreter to be present. Uh, Every major city in Texas has multiple agencies uh, who send staff uh, interpreters or or in-person interpreters to the encounter. We also have what we refer to as VRI, which is video remote interpreting, which takes place over a tablet or a computer. And so all parties are able to see and hear each other via video conference. So all of those uh, tools are readily available uh, and are affordable, believe it or not, uh, to uh, hospitals and leadership who care about their patients and, and want to make sure that they're able to communicate. So uh, for the most part, you know, I, I think about uh, my history. It's probably been six years or so since a patient has presented when we were not able to find the language uh, that we needed for that patient. So um, there are tools that are readily available to, to, to bridge that gap. I can only imagine in a large city, Houston being the fourth largest city in the States here, that it's, it's quite... Um, international and looking at the popularity of languages, you know, Chinese, Spanish, English, Hindi, Arabic, all of those, would you be able to bring somebody in in the hospital or is it actually done on the phone, Manuel? That often depends on the scenario, uh, which is being interpreted. Are you, um, you know, collecting simple information or are you giving simple information or are you dealing with a patient who is at an end of life scenario? But in general, All of uh, just about all of the languages that we um, commonly see in Texas, uh, all of those that you mentioned, as well as, you know, in the Dallas Fort Worth area, we have Burmese, we have Somali, uh, which are emerging languages. But yes, um, those agencies are able to meet those on site uh, interpreting demands. There are, uh, as you mentioned, about 4,600 languages that uh, currently survive in the world today. Uh, However, we don't see that array of languages typically in our hospitals. Um, I would say that well over 99% of the language demand that we see within the hospitals uh, come from our top 100 to 150 languages. Yes. So a a typical scenario that I would imagine, and you probably have seen this, and, and hopefully there's a way to work through it, but you see a young person escorting their elderly parent or grandparent into a healthcare center and they want to be the interpreter. Is that good or is that bad? What are the complications or rules surrounding that type of situation? That is great that the patient, uh, the patient's loved one wants to help them, but um, just as you would not ask that loved one to operate on your loved one, uh, you also wouldn't want uh, a loved one to interpret. First of all, they probably don't have the training in both languages to know medical terminology and concepts of the body that requires extensive training and knowledge. Additionally, the most common uh, complication that comes from family members wanting to interpret is that they bring bias into the encounter. And so every participant in the encounter deserves to have their message delivered to the other participants without bias. And we frequently see that family members like to filter the message. They don't want to interpret everything that was said. They want to change what was said. If they don't like a suggestion or a diagnosis that is made by the provider, um, they will oftentimes change that diagnosis or tell the loved one that everything is fine, or they will coach them how to answer questions if the patient doesn't know how to answer the questions. So we see a lot of bias, and uh, that ultimately uh, affects the, the care that the patient receives and the outcomes. 
Very good. And culture also affects this. Um, as Manuel was saying, sometimes the family member will change the message. In many countries, people believe that telling someone that they have cancer will only make them sicker or that it's bad luck to even say the word. So they will try not to upset the patient by telling them the bad news and simply sugarcoat it or, you know, work around that. That's one problem. The other problem is when you're bringing children to interpret that they, of course, don't know not only medical terminology, but they also don't know big words. I mean, if you have a child or a grandchild, you know that their vocabulary is not fully formed by age 10 or 12, let alone younger than that. So the message that is conveyed is not accurate. This episode is brought to you by the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, the definitive resource for healthcare management education in North Texas. The center is based in the Naveen Jindal School of Management at the University of Texas at Dallas. It plays a unique role in training the next generation of healthcare leaders to meet local, regional, and national demands. The Jindal School uses its strengths in accounting, administration, finance, marketing, and information systems to educate highly qualified personnel for healthcare administration and executive leadership positions. The center is home to seven healthcare leadership and management programs, including undergraduate and graduate programs, as well as executive programs for physicians and working professionals. For more information, visit us online at jindal.utdallas.edu forward slash healthcare. Maybe, Manuel, you could also add uh, what the legal requirements are. Is this something that is, is mandated by, by federal state law to have interpreters? So there are three laws uh, within the United States that we often refer to that dictate um, a patient's right to receive health care in the language that they prefer. Uh, the first is the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and that law says that any organization that receives funds from the federal government is not permitted to discriminate based upon race, color, or national origin. And so we often reference that uh, because the legal system, uh, the courts, uh, have time and time again uh, interpreted that to mean that you are not permitted to discriminate based upon the language that a person speaks. So you have to be able to provide equal access to health care regardless of the language spoken. Uh, the next law is the Americans with Disabilities Act, and that encompasses the, uh, the our patients who are deaf or hard of hearing. They also have the right to an interpreter. Uh, typically, your deaf and hard of hearing community will be much more aware of their legal rights than a person who requires a spoken language interpreter, and they, uh, the deaf and hard of hearing will insist on their rights oftentimes. And the third law is the Affordable Care Act of 2010, specifically Section 1557, which outlines the requirements for a health care interpreter. So uh, it's very important to make sure that we are in adherence with these laws, uh, regardless of where we practice medicine, uh, regardless of where our um, healthcare organization is located. Uh, just about uh, all healthcare organizations in the U.S. Uh, receive federal funds of some kind and thus are not permitted to discriminate uh, their patients. Um, even accepting Medicare or Medicaid is considered receiving federal funds. And so all of those organizations uh, that accept Medicare and Medicaid are also required to provide interpreters for their patients. So, Esther, you, you mentioned earlier about the need to have qualified, certified translators and interpreters. What type of certification is required? Who, who does a certification? Well, strangely enough, uh, there is no requirement for certification nationwide. And uh, it is available, but it's not required. Many um, hospitals will only hire certified nurses, certified radiologists, certified this and that, but they will use anyone <laughs> to interpret. So 
In Texas, to interpret in court, you must have a license. But you don't have to have a license or certification to work in healthcare as an interpreter. In order to obtain certification as a healthcare interpreter, you need to have a minimum of 40 hours of training. And that's really absolutely minimum. The Texas Advisory Committee on Qualifications for Healthcare Translators and Interpreters, of which I was vice chair, recommended 120 hours of training to include 40 hours of uh, on the job or mentoring um, training. And uh, so 40 hours is really minimal. In addition, you must demonstrate proficiency in English and your other language, and you must take a written and oral exam that is valid, that is uh, not biased in any way. And so there are two national organizations that offer this credential. The Certification Commission on Healthcare Interpreting and the National Board of Certification for Medical Interpreters. TAHIT uh, stands by the uh, Certification Commission for Healthcare Interpreters program. So uh, Manuel and I are both certified healthcare interpreters by that organization, so we should call CCHI for short. Now, that is not a requirement in Texas or anywhere else in the country. So we, if you look at it, you know, from, from a, a, a human perspective, it's more important for you to have an accurate interpreter in court than it is in a hospital. That doesn't really make sense. So we have uh, tried over the years, Tahit has tried over the years, to make uh, certification a, a mandatory qualification, but it is not yet. So what many hospitals are doing now is that when they hire interpreters, they expect them to become certified within a certain period of time. And when they contract interpreters through the various language service companies, they request that those interpreters be certified. But there is no requirement. Very interesting, because I would think the return on investment uh, would be significant. One lawsuit for doing something wrong versus the investment to make sure you can prove that you've got qualified and certified uh, people in a crucial line of, of, of the whole process would be very, very important. Uh, absolutely. So you, you, you mentioned hiring. Uh, do these terp- interpreters and translators actually work for the hospital most of the time? Not most of the time. Emmanuel, do you want to take this one? Sure. As Esther said, most of the time, interpreters do not uh, work for the hospital, although most hospital systems do have significant numbers of interpreters on their staff um, for the most common languages. Certainly, uh, here in Texas, we see staff interpreters speaking Mandarin, Arabic, and of course, uh, Spanish, as well as American Sign Language. And um, it has to be a holistic approach because you will never have enough interpreters on staff to meet all of the demand. And um, so there needs to be um, the the staggered approach where you have staff interpreters, on-site agency interpreters, as well as telephone and video uh, interpreters. Yeah, I would think that, you know, with the whole focus on quality today and all the value that all these organizations are going through with their workflow, that you'd have to make sure that the translation and interpretive services have been really well integrated within the hospital or the clinic workflow. It's got to just be a natural part of it, a partnership that is really well coordinated in order to work correctly. So I could see where that that is very important. You know, you talked about the training requirements. I could see we could spend 40 hours just on code of ethics training alone because that would be a very important component of doing the right thing as well. You know, being obedient to the non-enforceable, you know, making the right decisions when you have to and, and know what what you should be doing in terms of all the cultural things and everything else associated with the interpretation. Right. And uh, while there is no, no requirement, no, no state or national requirement 
for the use of qualified or certified interpreters. Uh, the Joint Commission has incorporated standards of performance to address this, and they became effective uh, January 1st of 2011. Um, there is uh, a standard uh, HR 01.02.01 .01 about uh, the hospital defining staff qualifications. And note four indicates qualifications for language interpreters and translators may be met through language proficiency assessment, education, training, and experience. Okay. So hiring or contracting someone who has certification is an easy way to demonstrate that. So as, as an organization, um, how big how big is the community of translators and interpreters? Do you have a, a national association? Do you have, you know, focus groups kind of like the Society for Human Resources, SHRM? They have big meetings and things like that. Have, mm -hmm. Is there a critical mass across the country that's organized yet, or is that something that's in the works? The American Translators Association, which also includes interpreters, is the largest association of language professionals in the U.S., and they have more than 10,000 members, but it is also an international organization. Okay. Then um, that organization has chapters, and in addition to the chapters, there are unaffiliated organizations. Tahit, for example, is an unaffiliated organization. In Austin, we have the Austin Area Translators and Interpreters Association. Um, Houston has the Houston Interpreters and Translators Association. Dallas has the Metroplex Interpreters and Translators Association. So we, we are organized. We do have um, professional groups. And TAHIT uh, has an annual symposium in which many of the interpreters throughout the state participate. Excellent. Well, maybe we can get the word out through all those associations of what, what uh, you guys are doing in your respective cities. I don't want to overlook one other important uh, aspect of this translation and interpretation. We haven't talked about uh, sign language. Is that included also in this overall communication process? Certainly. Yes, it is. And um, once again, the Texas Advisory Committee on Qualifications for Healthcare Translators and Interpreters, we call it Advisory Committee for short, um, uh -huh. uh, had um, 20 members, I believe, and half of those were from the sign language the, the community. Uh, sign language okay. interpreting community. And okay. uh, we learned a lot from each other. The, the sign language interpreters are um, much better known, um, have had uh, certification much longer than, than the foreign language interpreters, but we do share the idea of using qualified interpreters. For example, they would not promote the use of using a family member to interpret sign language for a patient. Uh, so yes, definitely. A question here, just an operational definition. It may be obvious, but I just want to make, make it sure it's clear to everybody. The difference between being interpreter and translator. Mm -hmm. An interpreter conveys language orally, and a translator conveys language in writing. Very good. That's, that's um, excellent. Yes, about 2% of the U.S. population knows that distinction. Um, so, so we are interpreters. Some of us are also translators, but we are, it's not an interchangeable skill. Well, this has been a very enlightening engagement with both of you, um, Esther and Manuel. I, I can't thank you enough for the insights that you've brought forward. I, I think there's an awareness factor here that we can help amplify. Mm -hmm. I think there's incredible value that is being communicated by the process and quality improvement that you reference. So look forward to following you in the future and, and staying current with what you're doing and, and the improvements that you're making. So we appreciate your time today. That's great. And if anyone uh, in the community would like to like help with, you know, setting up their language program, that's something that uh, people within Tahit can do. And the recommendations from the advisory committee about what to look for in the qualifications for translators and interpreters are also available um, 
through Tahit. We will reference your website with the podcast. We'll, we'll contain that in the text file with your podcast. So thank you for that. Um, Manuel, any last comments from you? Well, we appreciate that. And uh, just to reiterate what Esther said, um, lots of people know that they don't know um, uh, what needs to be done. And we want to be uh, a resource for uh, all of the healthcare organizations and providers in Texas and beyond. Uh, we primarily focus on our patients. Our patients are our, um, our, our, our priority, but we also represent all stakeholders in language access in healthcare. And if you don't know uh, what you need, uh, come join us for our annual symposium uh, here in Houston, September 13th and 14th. Uh, also, the information will be available on the website. And thank you for the opportunity to help get the word out uh, to providers across the state. Well, thank you both. I look forward to meeting you both in person at some point in time. So appreciate your time today and being part of our team. Thank you very much. Look forward to it. Thanks for listening to the Business of Healthcare podcast. Join us online at businessofhealthcarepodcast.com to find episode links, notes, and more. Be sure to subscribe to the Business of Healthcare podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app. To learn more about the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, Go to jundle.utdallas.edu and then search under the Center and Institutes tab on the navigation menu. Also, we want to hear from you. If you'd like to provide feedback, make suggestions for future guests or show topics, or just want to get in touch with us, email us at healthcarebizpodcast at utdallas.edu. Biz is spelled B-I-Z. And let us know how we're doing. I'm your host, Dr. Bob Kaiser, with the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, where we're leading change by changing how we lead.